Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I hope you're well. I hope you're keeping safe. Uh, my name is Michael Raimondo, and on behalf of Well Coast Conservation, a very, very warm welcome. If you've missed any of the past conversations, please go onto the Well Coast Conservation Facebook page or onto the YouTube page and you can uh, watch any of the past conversations. Um, so now we go over to the Kruger National Park and Lawrence is a wonderful human being. Uh, Lawrence, thank you very, very much for taking the time. Um, we really appreciate you sharing the work you're doing in, the, in that wonderful part of the world. Um, and uh, I hope you will. I hope it's not too cold and uh, maybe you can kick off on your side and tell us how, how you're doing this evening. Sure, thanks Michael. Firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of the work that you're doing and yeah, congratulations on a fascinating series that you guys have been running. Um, yeah, it is, it is pretty chilly up north. Um, we're not used to this kind of cold, so we're all bundled up, but very well. Good. Good. Thanks, Lawrence. I'm very excited to, to uh, hear your talk and I'm sure the audiences are just as excited. And uh, I've got a lot of questions at the end. So I'm sure given our, our limited time, would you like to kick off and um, go for it? Sure, sure. So good evening, everyone. Um, and there's, uh, so I've been working in uh, protected areas in South Africa for around 20 years now. And, uh, you know, with increasing... Um, so we're increasing vocal discussions around uh, what they, the so-called elephant problem. This idea that there are now too many elephants in our South African parks. So we've conducted a lot of, of, of our research focusing on, on this question. So I thought I'd share with you um, some of the basics. Uh, but before we get into that, just a bit about my history. So I'm primarily a plant ecologist. So my window into this world is, is that of a botanist. But I run um, university programs in the Kruger Park. I work for two organizations, OTS. Um, it's a study abroad organization from the States getting uh, students into the field, both undergraduate and graduate. And then about 10 years ago, we felt that we weren't doing enough for South Africans. So we set up the Sasani Trust, which does the same. So it's essentially uh, semester long, 100 day programs in the field. And the work I'm gonna to present today um, in order to discuss this elephant conservation challenge is actually a lot of these students and I just want to acknowledge our partners South African National Parks, um, Society Trust OTS and the University of Florida and collectively we are called we call ourselves the Skukuza Science Leadership Initiative and happy to chat about that later but for now elephants. So um, the, where the paradox comes in is that um, where elephants are not protected um, you see their, their numbers plummet. And if you look at this graph, I thought I'd just provide you the schematic. Uh, wherever the color is green, it's a, it's a, a reasonable growth rate in the elephant population. Uh, where it's yellow, it's a slightly declining population. And when it's red, it's declining precipitously. And what you're finding is that across most of East, Central and West Africa, the, the African elephant populations are are really are declining precipitously. And there are you know, a couple of papers that have been published on that. Uh, but in Southern Africa, notably Botswana and South Africa, and um, we're actually seeing quite um, uh, dramatic increases in the populations. And, and that's caused for some concern, particularly for conservatives that have been working in, this, in, in these parks for a long time. And there are probably around 415,000 elephants left in Africa and 5% of those in Kruger. So not a substantial number, but certainly, there's plenty of discussion in, in the public about whether there are too, much, too many elephants in the Kruger or not. And so for the last 15 years, that's what we've been doing, is trying to figure out whether in fact that is the case. So the thing about elephants is that they have massive appetites. Uh, I would imagine most of you have encountered them. Um, they can consume up to 300 kilograms of plant matter a day, so they literally are eating machines. And um, what's interesting about them is that they would be mixed feeders. Early in the growing season, they're primarily um, grazers, so they will uh, seek out the most palatable grasses in the landscape. And it's quite a thing to watch them grab a bunch of brush and, uh, grass and then bash the sand off on their feet and stick it in their mouths. Um, and as you get towards the end of the growth season, then they start to focus on the, 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 the flowers and the, the floral parts and all the seeds. And, um, 
once once we start to get into winter and the grasses lose their quality and in some cases the grasses actually extract their above ground nutrients to below ground storage organisms so the grass really does become dry and, and unpalatable even for animals as big as elephants they then switch to browse and they, you'll see them eating leaves um, and towards the end of the dry season particularly in drought years um, you, you'll see them start to peel bark off of the trees and uh, what they're really trying to do is, is get at that sort of that inner bark, the, the cambium and the phloem, which is very nutrient rich and also uh, uh, contains a lot of moisture. Um, and therein lies the crux for, um, for a lot of the issues that we face is this bark stripping at the end of, at the end of winter. Um, you can see one of my students there appearing at a recently debarked uh, a case in aggressance in Arbthorn. Um, and the challenge here is that the bark is a critically important uh, protective layer for, for, for many of these trees. Um, and notably, uh, in the first couple of years post stripping, it would be all these wood boring beetles. And you've all heard about the Chateau borer beetle that's, um, take, that's getting into many of our cities. Well, we've got thousands of those species in South Africa, anyhow, indigenous species. And the be pressed the jewel beetles and these gorgeous longhorn beetles. And you started with the tiny little Chateau borer beetles and then as they penetrate into the stem, you end up with a whole bunch of these much bigger boring beetles. And that penetration results in um, xylem drying out and becoming a lot more flammable. But I'll talk a little bit about that just now. So as I said, they're mixed feeders, so they start on grass and they work their way until the end of the dry season into eating, uh, into eating bark. So we're really curious about what this means for, for many of these plant populations in, in understanding the effects on, on tree demography, not only the individual deaths, but the, the demography of, of various species. Um, but allied to the, the damage that they might cause, they also topple and break trees. And I didn't believe it up until recently, but they also do eat seedlings. I always thought that a tiny little marula or, or knobthorn would be wouldn't be worth its time, but we, we spend a bit of time in the far north of the Kruger Park in the Bafuri district. I have a master's student working on uh, those floodplain forests in the north, and you should really get there if you can. And we watched this uh, young bull just plucking out hundreds of seedlings, and in about the space of five minutes, he'd, we counted that he, he plucked out 60 seedlings, and he's just it's like eating popcorn. And um, so really, they, they do impact um, the seedlings of baobabs and thorns and, and various acacia species. Um, and then what's unusual about elephants is they're pushing over trees. And uh, you know, there, there's so many arguments out there as to why elephants push over trees. But I have a colleague, Jeremy Midgley, who came up with a very, well, certainly it's an amusing paper, but it's a bit just scientifically serious paper, but postulating why elephants push over trees. And, and one of the key arguments is that they, they're feeding. And so in pushing down the tree, they're getting at the, the high quality forage in the, in the canopy. But very often, as you can see here, this elephant is now pushed over the tree and it, it nibbles on a few roots and then pushes off. And then the second argument is, well, you know, they, they snap the canopy like you can see this as uh, on the bottom left here. And then it means when they come back the next year, then, you know, the forage is available much closer to the ground and also for the youngsters in the population. But that's, that's a tricky thing to prove because um, you, you, you've got to come back to that self-same individual for that to be advantageous. And then the other, the other argument is that they are showing off the ladies, um, and which is also not the case because it's mostly the bulls that push over the trees and often in the absence of the breeding herds. So it's just these young bulls pushing over trees with nobody to witness them. And so the argument is that actually they're pumping iron. They, uh, they're literally getting fit and strong. And it's often the younger bulls that are that pushing over the trees. And so Jeremy would argue that actually they, they're pumping iron, they're getting ready to do battle with the, the bigger males for breeding rights in the herds. So you know, all these subtle little questions that you keep asking around, um, you know, the impact that elephants might have on plant communities. So, you know, with, with them pushing over trees, um, if you've been a manager in these parks for a long time, and certainly members of the public that are, that are used to hearing about the culling period, um, you know, if you start seeing dramatic changes in the park, then the alarm bells start to ring. And this is one of my favorite conservators, Ian White, who was, was head of the, the conservation of, of large mammals in the Kruger. This is one of his graphs from uh, the mid 90s, where he was really getting concerned about the elephant numbers. And this is just a brief snapshot into elephants um, in the last 120 years in the Lowfelt. 
And if you look on the, on the bottom, that's uh, the year of the population estimate going right back to the turn of the last century. And on the y-axis, we've got the population estimate. And those estimates are, you know, it's very hard those collected those data. It would have been either walking transects on foot and in the 1960s, they started with fixed wing flights. Um, and what we see is a, you know, it's a quite a dramatic increase um, in the elephant population because they're all but um, extirpated in the low field because of hunting, because of ivory hunting. And um, the argument is that these elephants would have repopulated these areas from Mozambique or Zimbabwe. And then in the early 60s, they started the, the first proper census uh, using fixed or mid 60s, uh, fixing planes. And they were alarmed to find that there were almost 7,000 elephants in the park. And at that stage, a key concept employed in the conservation realms is this idea of carrying capacity, which is a, is a concept that's derived from American farming. Um, and the idea is that you can calculate the amount of forage in the landscape, so the biomass of grass at the critical time of the year. And then from that grass biomass kilograms per hectare, you can calculate how many cattle you can have on your, on your property. And what they did is it's just simple calculation of, well, one elephant weighs about 40 cattle, therefore, uh, you know, they, they did the math and they said, Kruger can handle 7,000 elephants. And so in that period, 67 to 94, they went through this period of cutting and they, they you know, they removed quite a substantial number of, of elephants from the park. And they had the sort of upper limits and the lower limits. And as long as the number was in there somewhere, then it was okay. But with the change in politics in, in 1994, South Africa threw open the doors, the advent of democracy in South Africa also resulted in enormous international scrutiny as to how we manage our parks. And so culling was terminated in 94. And like any culled population, any, you know, whether it be fleas, cockroaches, rodents, caracal, and uh, uh, even jackal, and this is why it's pointless culling jackal in the Karoo, um, their numbers just bounce back dramatically. So culling is, is, a, is a tricky um, tool to use. Um, so we've, like any population, you see the numbers go up and, and the numbers are now in 2020 are close to uh, 2021 20, odd thousand animals. So, you know, if you're, a, if you're a conservative that's been working here for some time, that can be somewhat alarming, particularly if you start to see big trees disappear. And it's work like this that has really um, fired up the imagination. And this is a really neat piece of work done by um, the vegetation ecologist in the park at the time, Holger Eckhart. And we were quite critical of his work. And this is a, it's a series of, I think it's about 120 fixed point photographs across the whole park. And they take them on a regular basis. And they, they, that program still continues today. And he would start comparing these fixed point photos saying, look at, these, look at the rates of loss of trees. And our criticism was, well, you know, it's an image and who knows what's happening on the other side and you can't really tell if there are any seedlings in the landscape. So we, you know, we took it with a pinch of salt and, well, the, the most recent data is certainly supporting his, his, uh, his findings. So um, certainly a cause for further research. And then images like this started to emerge as well. So this is uh, taken by um, a colleague of mine, Rena Grant, who was a landscape ecologist in the Kruger. And she'd flown over um, a fence that was erected some 30 odd years ago. And this is a, you can see that very distinct outline of this fenced off area. It's a closed off area and it was, it was established to understand why the rare antelope were disappearing from the park, uh, of roan antelope and sable. And so what they'd done is they built this fence and inside of the fence they cleared all animals bigger than a rabbit and just maintained these uh, roan antelope and the sable antelope and outside of course the full suite of, of uh, mammalian species and carnivores. Um, but they burnt, they, they burnt the inside of the exclosure at the, at the same regime that did the outside. And the argument is that the only difference between inside and outside therefore would be um, elephants in, in, in knocking over the big trees. But you could also argue that impala are really important for uh, suppressing regeneration. Anyhow, so when you start seeing images like this, you think, geez, elephants must be having a huge impact on, on these landscapes. And so, you know, again, a cause for, for real concern. And, uh, you know, something that's, that's really important at the moment, um, and the broader context for this question, is this global decline in large, old trees. And there's a fabulous paper written um, in science, which outlines 
just the, the rate at which trees are disappearing and that would be as, as a consequence of logging and we've we've all heard stories about logging in Mozambique and Angola and Central African Republic and beyond. Uh, land use change and this is an image of a hydroelectric dam that was built in, in Suriname in, in uh, South America. Um, so it's land use change, logging, but also climate change and the argument is that particularly the, the very big trees have a high resource requirement, particularly water and, and nutrients. Nutrients shouldn't be too much of a problem, but it's water that's a real issue. And they've done some, some work of late looking at uh, the impact on the baobabs, the biggest trees in the world. And, and the argument is that we've lost, you know, they've, they've aged and tagged uh, 10 odd trees and, and half of those have, have perished. And uh, for no reason that they could see, so it wasn't related to elephants, um, elephant impact in the argument is that they, they're dying because of climate change. Anyhow, so the background is that all these trees around the world, the biggest trees are dying. And so obviously this is a real concern for us in the Kruger. And so why big trees? Why, you know, um, uh, being a botanist, this is my pet subject. And this is an image of, of the Lower Sabi district looking up towards the Great Drakensberg Escarpment. And it's a heavily treed environment. And um, these trees are considered to be keystone structures in, in the landscape for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the picture on the bottom left um, indicates a number of things. Um, for one, um, because of the, their size, their roots would penetrate some substantial depths. And through a process of hydraulic lift, they literally um, change the microclimate beneath the canopy of the trees. Not only are they bringing water and nutrients to the surface, close to the surface through their root mass, but also the shading effects result in uh, a decrease in evaporation of, of water from, from the slight subsoil surfaces. So you get a completely different um, microclimate beneath big trees, particularly when their canopies are, are, are joined. Um, and, and so you've got a, a, an enhancement of resources beneath the canopy. We've also got increased shade, which of course attracts animals from, from, all, from all areas. And they're seeking the high quality forage beneath the trees, as well as seeking shade during the hottest part of the day. And you can witness it now during the, during the, the hottest periods, you, you'll find even herds of elephants beneath um, dense canopies. Um, allied to that, um, the trees are also critical structures for a range of resident faunal communities. And I'm making, I'm making some examples here of, of birds, you know, whether it be nesting birds of the small, so smaller variety like this, um, uh, um, sunbird um, or some of the vultures in in the Kruger Park and the vultures incredibly picky as to which species they they like to nest in and this is an image of a case like crescent and not thorn and because it's so spiny and you you will uh, you can charge for yourself when you leap into one of them possible to get out of so when you are being charged by a rhino you don't definitely don't want to climb a knob thorn but because of that spininess you um, it, 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 uh, the branches have a greater purchase. So when, when the, the uh, vultures are building the nest, you know, the, the branches will stay in the canopy. And unfortunately, it's also, there are cases that are most palatable. And so we are starting to see quite a decline in the roosting sites for, uh, for many of these vultures. And certainly you can imagine for other nesting birds, but also a whole suite of birds that forage off the foliage. Um, so all the um, you know, fly catchers and shrikes that you see bustling in the dense vegetation. If we lose that vegetation structure, we lose those suites of species. Equally so, uh, there are a whole bunch of bat communities, uh, what they call the clutter bats or the clutter edge bats, those that specialize in very dense vegetation. Uh, if the vegetation disappears, that's it. And so obviously, you know, we're concerned about these trickle down effects and I'll speak a little bit about that in a second. The thing about all of this is that it's not just elephants alone. Um, and I mentioned bark stripping earlier, and um, it's, it's, the, it's the combination of the elephants stripping the bark from the trees and breaking branches, but also the regular intense burns. And fire intensity itself is, is a critical feature. We all know that savannas burn regularly, much like the fynbos, um, although typically the wet the savannah, the more frequent it burns and more intense, and the dry the savannah, some of those fire frequencies, if you think of the set of Kalahari, that only really burns once in every 30 years, whereas Pretoria's cop or Zulu land, parts of Zulu land, Lutu and Fulosi, particularly Lutu, will burn every other year, sometimes even um, annually. 
And life is really rough for a woody plant under those circumstances. So I've just got a schematic on the bottom there. Um, if you're a young seedling and you know, you've got to get pollinated and you've got to get dispersed um, and then you fall on the ground and you germinate and then you've got to make it through not only what they call the browse trap, but also the fire trap. And so I think, um, you know, I think about the, the enormous biomass of, of impalas and kudus in the Kruger Park and they'll seek out anything palatable and even the elephants. And so you're going to make it through there and then you're still going to make it through the fire. And some of these trees are ancient. So we know, all know about how old baobabs are and the argument is that they're up to 2,000 years old. Um, but something like a leadwood, they can grow to about 1,000 years, knobthorn 700, uh, marula 300 years. So the life cycle is incredibly slow. The turnover is very slow. So if you're losing all the structure, it certainly uh, um, it takes a long time to replace. And so this just exacerbates this, this so-called elephant problem. And, and uh, there's a, my favorite tree up in, in Puna Maria, it's this half hollowed out one. And we go back every year and have a good look at it. And it's still fine, still growing happily. So as long as there's enough structural integrity and just a little bit of bark, life is good, but guaranteed one day that poor tree is going to keel over. So we know the trees are being impacted, big trees are being pushed over. We know that's starting to have an impact to some degree um, on the demography of some of these trees. And I'm going to summarize all the, the key findings for you in a second. But you're also worried about the knock-on effects, what they call the trophic cascades. So a large part of our work, and I'll, I'll describe the project in a second, um, is associated with these um, biodiversity surveys. It's this extravaganza of, of biology. And we've looked at um, the Sabi River, we've looked at um, the Northern Plains up in uh, Puna Maria. And lately we've established a much bigger project down south. And we set out these drift fences for herpetofauna, so frogs and snakes. Always entertaining when you catch a snake in your pitfall trap or in your snake trap, because somebody's got to take it out. Um, and the other thing is I often catch scorpions as well. Now you've got to stick your hand in and get the poor frog out. Um, and so we uh, spend a lot of time with long brightongs holding these things out. We small mammal trapping, we use live trapping so they don't hurt the animals. Uh, dung beetle work, we use camera traps. I've included a couple of images from our camera traps there. Um, so it really is an extravaganza of biodiversity. And as I say, we started with small numbers in the Cyber River and we subsequently scaled up our research dramatically. And there's this fabulous um, relationship um, we've, we've termed it the Browse Project. It's a biodiversity research on savannas ecosystems. Um, and we partner with University of Florida, um, Sandparks, and University of Eswatini. And we work with these fabulous students from all around Southern Africa and a couple of our young Americans thrown in. And what you're doing is you're comparing the southern parts of the Kruak with the northern parts of Swaziland. Same soil, same climatic envelope, same vegetation. And the only real difference is in the Kruger, we see obviously plenty of elephants, but also regular, very intense burns. Down in Swatini, um, no elephants, so no mega herbivores, um, and very irregular fire. So some areas they burn super hot, super frequently, and others they, they simply don't burn at all. And what we're finding though is it, two things, well, three things. So one is trees are definitely being impacted. But it turns out there's actually plenty of regeneration, plenty of seedlings just lurking in the understory. So as soon as there's a gap, as soon as you stop burning, and as soon as you remove animals from, from the landscape, and I'll talk about that in a second, you'd expect these seedlings to, to emerge from the grass layer and, and that the canopy could recover. As long as there's uh, a cessation in, in both the fire and the, uh, the elephant impacts. Um, the other is there's, there's no doubt with the loss of trees, you see a change in vegetation structure. So a loss of ecosystem heterogeneity. And with the decline in heterogeneity, you definitely see a decline in, in diversity, but also functional diversity. So we see this in birds, we see it in bats, and we see it in small mammals. So all the gills that we're looking at, you definitely see a decline. But the trick here though, is actually they're very different communities. So it turns out even though if you're losing structure, you still need these open areas. And so um, it's important to have both. And so some elephant utilization in these landscapes is important, but it's overutilization that you're concerned about. So what you really want to do is we want to, we want to manage and maintain all these states. And so now we've done the functional work. And as I say, there's no doubt from the data we've published it recently that if you're losing vegetation, if you're losing those big trees, it definitely changes the game. 
uh, and you started to you start to uh, see a decline in biodiversity. Um, so the trip now, and I'll get to that in a second, and to talk about the uh, the management philosophy of, of sand parks and what it is that they're doing about this this decline in in diversity and heterogeneity. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about the work that you're doing. So we find ourselves in a very interesting position. So in the Kruger, now we've done this work for six years in these open landscapes, but in Swaziland, um, the vegetation is still intact, but there we have another problem. And no doubt you guys have, have read plenty about climate change, but one of the key issues around climate change and savannas in particular, is that woody plants are, that benefit enormously from the elevated CO2 um, relative to grasses. Savannas are critically important to um, the survival of humans on this planet uh, for a variety of reasons. Most of our ecosystem services come from, from savannas, most of the farming areas in savannas, um, and also they're really important for carbon sequestration. And so if we're losing savannas, we, we, we lose enormous ecosystem services and uh, with catastrophic uh, implications for humankind. And so, um, the picture on the bottom right is a picture of what we call bush encroachment. And it's not the big trees that are performing, but I think you know, they'll grow well, but it's actually the short, scrubby, very dense stands that uh, the, the plants that do, do really well. So in this case, it's something called sickle bush. And I defy you to go and crawl through there, which we have to do on a regular basis. And it's not very pleasant. Anyhow, so now we have this very open area in the Kruger, this very dense area in Swaziland, Eswatini, some without the bush encroachment, others with bush encroachment. But now what you're doing is we've put up fences in the Kruger and we've cut down almost a hectare at a time of the Stachystachys. And so now we, we're experimenting with savannas. We're interested in the rates of recovery. How, what is the mechanism of recovery? And I mentioned just now that all these seedlings lurking in the understory. And the argument is that if we, once we put up these fences, they might well recover and lo and behold, that's what you're finding now. And so what we might find in, and this picture of the very empty landscape is one in the Kruger, it might well recover um, to these well-established stands of knob thorns. The problem is that we, we are concerned about the Dicrostachys, and this is where elephants actually might become the saviors of savannas in the sense that they are suppressing that bush encroachment. Anyhow, so we're interested in uh, uh, mechanism recovery. The other is that because we've been doing this for six years now, and we're gonna continue ad infinitum, um, and if there's anybody in the audience that is interested in uh, doing some work in the Kruger, feel free to contact me, we'll put you to work. Um, but we, we're gonna carry on with this work ad infinitum, and so we, we'll get some sense of the, uh, the, the effects of climate change. We were fortunate to have done the work recently through the most intense drought in history, uh, in the savannas of the Kruger. It's a very short drought, but very intense. And so we got great data that have emerged from that and looking at how well the, the ecosystems recover. And it turns out uh, mostly small mammals and birds and bat communities bounce back really well from drought. But the question now is vegetation structure and climate change. And then one of the interesting ones is um, you're changing the landscape of fear. If you, if you live in a very open environment, it's much easier to see the predators coming. Uh, whereas in a very dense environment, life is a bit rough. And uh, so we actually, that's one of the sub projects we're looking at is how does, um, how does this opening up the vegetation and then temporary uh, replacement by putting up fences, how does it change the landscape of fear and the animal behavior? So we're really diving into the subtleties of, of these trophic cascades, the trickle down effects um, in these systems. I, and I've spoken a little bit about the negative stuff, but I, I do want to highlight the fact that elephants are also critical in other ways for ecosystem functioning. The one that many of you might have heard about is in particularly in the drought periods, um, elephants, you know, they'll dig holes in, in dry riverbeds and, you know, as the, the surface water dries up and the river flow declines, um, there's a subsurface flow and the elephants uh, are very fussy drinkers, particularly the big old males and the, uh, sorry, the um, breeding herds and they'll dig holes in the uh, riverbed and that opens up these little pockets of resources for all kinds of other herbivores in the landscape, all kinds of other animals. So very often you'll see an elephant like this digging a hole, come back a day later, and there's an image there of, uh, of a little water hole that develops. And, um, you know, it, it's a resource for other animals in the landscape. And then one of our favorite projects is, is uh, looking at elephants as dispersers. So there are a whole bunch of, of species in savanna systems. It's, it's, more, um, it's more common in the forested systems of Central Africa 
and um, I think up to 70 species in the forests of Central Africa depend on the elephants for dispersal and germination. Uh, we're looking at the same thing now in, in savannas, and there are a whole suite of species, marullas um, being the most common of those that certainly you guys did know, but also this, this very awful smelling uh, Balanites morgamia, this thing on the right, uh, it's a green spike thorn that elephants will go berserk for. They will literally trample fences to get to these fruits. And this is a, a, a picture, actually it's my wife doing the work. Um, and she was, we feed, we work some tame elephants at, um, we're very fortunate to collaborate with um, Elephant Whispers just outside Hazyview. And they've got six um, captive elephants. They, they're orphans from the culling era and they're just the most fabulous animals. Um, we looked into the ethics of how they manage their, their animals and we were comfortable with the way they, they treat the animals. So we've been working with them for the last while. And what we do is we feed, the, feed the elephants these fruits one by one. And then, you know, if you're eating 30, 300 kilograms of forage, you're producing about 150 to 200 kilograms of, of elephant dung a day. So our various students over the years have had to rake through, well, before they discovered rakes, they're due to their hands. Uh, which was also a very smelly episode. But so you've got to collect dung for about four days, six elephants, 200 kilograms a day. That's a fair amount of dung. And so you feed the fruits and then you, you, you see how long it takes for the fruits to pass through the elephants. And usually it takes about 36 hours to 42 hours for those nuts. And you'll see the, the hard nuts at, uh, in the middle there um, to pass through the elephants. Um, and so in that time, they can move up to 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers. So they can actually disperse see some substantial distances in the landscape. And we're doing the genetic work now. We've collected samples from 100 kilometer transect just to look at relatedness across these gradients. Um, but then there's another, there's another step in the dispersal. And it's not only the elephants that disperse the fruits, and they also enhance the germination. So we've tested now, you pass the marilla through the elephant, and then you uh, plant that, or you pass the balanites through it. And uh, you see a market increase in the germination of the seeds that are passed through the elephant versus those that are not. And it's actually the crushing of the nut. So all of these elephant dispersed things have incredibly hard nuts. And so they give it a bit of a squeeze when, they, when they're chewing the fruit. And that's just enough to crack the perculum, just to let a bit of moisture in there. But what's equally important is if they get buried. And so the squirrel is practicing what they call scatter hoarding. So none of our, none of our rodents in South Africa have uh, cheeks, or actually there's one, the part cheek mask. Um, but we don't have cheeks like the North American or the Northern Hemisphere mice because many of these um, mice uh, or these rodents don't um, uh, hoard as much in their larder as the Northern American counterparts before they can, because they can forage year round. So what they do is they, and now the elephants have concentrated the seeds in the dung pile and they'll scoff as many as they can before they start getting unks. So this landscape of fear bulls and you can literally, they, you can watch them, they get in there, choose as many as they can and then they start getting unks. And then they disappear and what they do is take one or two seeds at a time and they scuttle and they bury it at two centimeters and they scuttle back, take a few more and they bury it. And then they forget where they, they bury their seeds. And so we've, we've put tags in the seeds, uh, uh, luminous tags, and then we watch them bury it. And then we come back at night, which is a bit awkward uh, in a Kruger. And then you use a UV torch to look for these fluorescent strings. And there you find them buried about two centimeters below the ground. And that burial, results in a far better germination of these seeds. It does yield all kinds of nervous moments for the students and they very well behaved under those uh, at night, under those circumstances. But it's uh, just a fabulous project that a bunch of students have now published on. Anyhow, so just to remind everybody that elephants are critically important for savannah functioning. So what is what has the Kruger Park done? Well, historically, uh, we know about the culling and that's, um, that's actually, um, that ended in the mid 90s. But in, in about 2008, we all participated in what we call the elephant assessment. And the idea was to see whether we could, we could what was available to uh, elephant managers uh, in, in managing elephant populations. And actually, all of it's been approved. So it's even, even, even what they call, they don't call culling, culling, culling anymore. They now call it uh, lethal management because it's a more accurate term. But there's a whole suite of, of uh, actions you have to go through before you can even think about culling, and therefore culling is not really on the table anymore. But the first one is translocation and the establishment of corridors. And the best example, um, and it's also local because I work here, is, is uh, the Greater Popo Transfrontier Park. Um, Mike is very familiar with that, having worked there for a number of months. But um, 
And the idea was that they, they dropped the fences between the Kruger and Limpopo National Park. But of course, we've also um, distributed elephants to a number of small reserves around um, South Africa. And the most famous examples would be the removal of um, orphans from culling events um, in the uh, late 70s to Pilansburg and to Hilu and Fulosi. And the challenge there was, and the reason I put the picture of the rhino up there, is that they were actually, uh, this translocation of elephants, you know, these elephants arrived in a novel landscape with no competitors and the, and the, the population boomed. And the elephants can, the populations grow at about 6% per annum, which is about the same rate at which traffic is growing in Los Angeles. So it doubles every 10 years. And uh, so the, they started killing runners because there were no older bulls or the old females to manage these younger bulls that were completely out of control. These teenagers that suddenly had access to the breeding herds. And um, these youngsters would remain in must for months on end. And if, and they literally, they, 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 they end up in this transformed state. And if you ever you know, on foot and you smell an elephant in must, as I'm sure many of you know, you're out of here. So we have students in the field, we're done, we're back in the car and out of there. Um, but now you have these populations without any parental control in either Pilonsburg and in and Fulosi, and they started killing rhinos sort of up to five a year. And it's quite a thing to watch this poor rhino being chased up a very steep hill by five young elephant bulls. And sometimes they try to mate with the rhinos and other times they literally just kill them. And the problem was very easy to solve when they had, when they got trucks big enough uh, to transport the big bulls and the big females and literally boom, overnight, the problems went away because the, the males exerted control over the young out of control bulls and the, the bigger females protected the, the breeding herds. So translocation is an option, but they've run out of space in South Africa. And some 2000 elephants are now, now, I think the number's around 2000, moved into Limpopo National Park. There's a very funny story about that. Um, so it's just about the time that Nelson Mandela got married to Grash Michelle. Obviously he needed to pay Lobola and the Lobola was 20 elephants from the Kruger Park. So they dutifully darted these animals, collared them, and then took them off to just north of Masingir, dropped them off. And within two days, they watched the collars, the elephants mulled around for a little bit, and then made a beeline rip, straight back down to where they were, they were darted. And the joke was at the time that the Mozambicans were looking for a recall of the wife because the Labola had been stolen. Um, so that has proved to be very effective, but we're kind of running out of space now. And, and one of the other problems is, of course, that people live in the Limpopo River Valley. They've now been moved on to uh, uh, just on the edges of the park. But there, there, was, there was quite substantial um, sort of elephant-human uh, conflict because elephants would go in and eat granary stores. That, you know, for these very poor populations, uh, you know, the granaries would be food for a year. If that disappears, then you're in deep trouble. A compensation was paid, but nonetheless, it, it certainly results in some change. So that was the one thing, is, is translocation. Um, and if they should get to the point where they can continue the corridor up into Gondorazo and then and here and then beyond, then certainly uh, um, it might be a, a longer term solution. But one of the interesting asides here is that, and this is an image looking into to Mozambique, those are mostly sand felt districts, so a deep lens of sand that originates down uh, probably in, in central to northern Zululand, and it's this deep swathe of marine, ancient deposition of marine sands five million years ago, but very nutrient poor, so the forage quality is not that great. So elephants do prefer to, to stay in the Kruger Park. Um, the other was contraception, and, and no doubt you guys have, have heard about contraception, um, and it actually proved really effective in small reserves, small fence reserves like Pilansburg and uh, uh, Marakele, um, thorny bush, sorry, not plants, but thorny bush and, and others. And they were able to contracept to the elephants and, and the technology has changed quite dramatically. 20 years ago, it was hyper expensive, 10,000 Rand per darting event. Um, but as the technology improved up to about 15 years ago, um, what they would do is they'd fly over a population. And as long as they contracepted 80% of the breeding females, um, then it was okay. They'd, they'd contracept the elephant. They'd, that they do a good enough job. And uh, so the old technology is you, had a, you darted the animal and then you also painted it. So you had, a, you had a dart gun and you had a paintball gun and you marked the animal with permanent dye. And then you come back a year later and do the same animal. But with the newer technologies, you can see he's, he's, um, uh, the vet has got a whole ton of darts there, literally just fly over and dart all the animals. So it amounts to about um, 
I think, I think it's about 10,000 random elephants. And so in a smaller population, that's feasible, but you can imagine in the Kruger Park where you've got a dart around 5,000 animals now, it just simply is not feasible. And if you're spending that amount of money on contracepting elephants, you know, that money could be better spent, some would argue, outside of the park in, the, in developing um, industries um, to offset poverty. And this is an image of some of the students that helped um, with one of the one of the darting episodes. But interestingly, um, contraception has lost favor because a, a main income stream in some of these smaller reserves are the uh, um, trust want to see baby elephants. And we're just not seeing baby elephants anymore. So that is one of the pressures. And then we also think that there, and some really good work done by Audrey Del Sink and her team, um, is that you think there are also social consequences to um, much smaller herds. And there's a great image of, of uh, one image of a great herd in Mapungubwe. I love the tiny little one at the back. Uh, but probably four generations of, of elephants there. And, um, and with the shrinking elephant herd size, the argument is that there's some behavioral consequences as well. So, so nothing is really simple in the story. And they have also contracepted males if they dart them and they snip the tubes. But the problem is that um, these big bulls, which have, which win the right to, uh, they, com they compete for the right to 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 mate with the uh, the females or the breeding herd. Um, but if if the females are not uh, falling pregnant, uh, they remain in estrus, and and uh, and these males keep covering them, and it's an enormously stressful experience for the for the females, which are much smaller than the males. So it is it is a tricky situation. But probably the most effective one of late, and this is really one of the key um, elements to Sand Park's management plan right now, is they've dropped the fences, they've moved vast numbers of elephants to the private game reserves and into Limpopo, and they've really done a good job of, of, of moving elephants. Uh, but the other is the closure of water points, the artificial water points, and um, it's done for two reasons. So water points were introduced, just a bit of history, water points were introduced to the park in the 1930s. And you know, the, given the shape of the Kruger, it's a very long north and south, but very narrow east to west. And that had a lot to do with the establishment in the Tsetse fly belt. And so the reason they could actually proclaim the Kruger is that nobody lived there because of the, because of the, of the Tsetse fly. And uh, just as some place malaria was a big problem. And so it was vacant land used only for hunting. So that's why the Kruger was established there. But in putting up the barriers to prevent disease emerging from the Kruger, so anthrax and foot and mouth, is endemic to our savanna systems and endemic if you find uh, indigenous species. Um, you know, the, the, the vets, particularly when it comes to foot and mouth, because it can have this real impact on, on, on commercial farming to the point where if you have foot and mouth, much like mad cow disease, you can't trade with Europe. Um, so we have this fence to prevent animals from moving out. And that's the real reason we have fences, not, not so much to keep um, lions and, and, and uh, elephants in, um, is, is managing the spread of disease. But in so doing, they couldn't move east-west to satisfy their winter water and forage requirements. So now these animals are trapped in this narrow band, and so they put in all these water points. But then it also got into our tourist psyche. You know, tourists come to Kruger, lay claim to their water points, and Jan uh, Sachat and all kinds of things where people used to go camp out for the whole day just to watch at their water points. And uh, um, it's a great place to view animals. And you can see this massive herd of, of buffalo there. Um, great place to see animals. The problem was, is that, um, well, the problem is that if you provide artificial water points in the, in the park, you maintain um, these animal populations at artificially high density. So all the bulk grazers, zebras, fulvias, buffalo, too many of those. And if you have artificially elevated densities, if in a drought period you have massive crashes, uh, but you also have increased lion population, which then has an impact on these, these rare antelope, the sable and the, um, and the roans. So the unintended consequences of providing water has a massive trickle-down effect. And so it turns out with elephants, you have the same problem. Um, at no point where at the height of all the water provisioning did an elephant have to move more than five kilometers to get to water. The problem is that the elephants then remain in a very stress-free state. So they maintain body conditioning. Um, and the only, the only real problem is access to forage. But because they're so big and they can break down trees, it wasn't really a problem. And so that maintained the breeding at very high levels. So what the park has now done is they've removed all but 70 of the 360 odd water points. And they've also blown up a whole bunch of dams. And, um, 
And what that's resulted in is some areas of the park, you need, elephants will need to travel sort of up to 15 kilometers to get to, to decent water. And that renders some of them, the, the, the more vulnerable parts of the, of the, of the elephant populations, the, these herds, uh, so more vulnerable to, to, um, to dying off uh, in, in the very dry periods, which is, which is what you really want to see in, in, um, in maintaining these natural fluxes of population. So it's the recently weaned cow, uh, calves that, that start to take strain. Uh, the, the females lose body condition in the winter months, so they don't breed quite as fast. And what you're now seeing from a fecundity of a, a sort of a growth rate of around six percent per annum, it's declined down to about two percent. So it's actually working. So the the, the park has done a, a good job about in 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 um, reducing the growth rate. So now elephants, uh, the population is growing at the same rate as humans in Africa. The other argument, and this is a really critical argument, I'm going to make this point in two different ways, is that the the sand parks. Uh, scientists are saying, well, look, the, the park is enormously variable. And I show you some images here. This is the far south of the heavily treed area. This is a, an image of the, the eastern part of the park and the basaltic soils, uh, very sparse trees. And that's an image of the, the far north, the, the baobab dominated far north of the park. Um, it's highly variable. And so much as we're finding data down in the south in these, um, in this, uh, on, the, on the basaltic soils that are suggesting a decline in, in uh, habitat structure and therefore diversity of faunal communities, they acknowledge it clearly. But the argument is we really need to see the, the Kruger Park as a unit. So you can't have a one size fits all policy to managing elephants. And so what they're now doing is monitoring structural change of the whole park. So yes, there's a loss of structure down this part, but it turns out those open areas are important because they support a different suite of species. So what they're now doing is monitoring this variation in vegetation structure across the whole park using laser imagery and aerial photography. And uh, once they're seeing that the, the overall decline of the whole park, then they would feel that they, they would need to start uh, um, taking action. So at this stage, you know, it's, it's a wait and see. We're collecting the monitoring data. Um, we, we clearly understand that elephants can have at a very local scale a, a negative impact on biodiversity. Um, but it's a broad scale. Um, the feeling is that uh, it's no need to act quite as yet. So the other thing that's really important is that they're, they're not interested in managing elephant numbers, but they're interested in managing once you see an effect. So that's what we're doing. It's like you look at the elephant behavior, the breeding, at, at least the, the impact on the vegetation. And once we feel the ecological effect is no longer sustainable, then we need to start managing. And then you've got all those, those whole suite of management options available to them. But the key point, the park is vast, it's heterogeneous, and at this stage, there's no overall concern. Yes, we are losing big trees, but it's when we're seeing that across the whole park that we really should start to get concerned, and, it, and we haven't got to that point as yet. However, there is, I guess, one last wrinkle in this, in this question here, and it's allied to two vulnerable areas in the park. Uh, the far north, which is a part of the park that is dominated by succulent tree species, and the baobab being the biggest succulent, of course, that's your favorite tree, as it is mine. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of coniferas and, and, and others and aloes that dominate the far north. And also um, the southern parts of the park around Pretorius Corp and those beautiful copies around Berghandel, which are dominated by uh, fairly rare species in the park, certainly like Kiart and these beautiful um, stands of, of, of Marilla. And so it's those areas that uh, the park does feel that they need to start thinking about management. So there's some great projects we're doing and our students have done some fabulous work on the use of bees. And I, I cite Lucy King here because she's really the expert in this and her Elephants and Bees project, well worth having a look, I put the URL there. And real worth, really worth looking into some of her stuff. And the idea is that bee, uh, elephants are terrified of bees and particularly when they're swarming. And, what, and they, they get up the trunk and uh, they're incredibly sensitive. And, and we, so what we did in the Kruger is we put our beehives around waterholes and, um, and, but actually before we did that, we, we mixed um, honey and water and aerosolized it and then played the sound of swarming bees. So we snuck up to elephant herds, wait until they, uh, they were calm. And then we played the sound of the bees and squirted the water and the elephants just bolted from the area. So they, it's, it's a trigger for them to move. And then we put up hives um, around waterholes, but during the drought period, um, and then elephants would come to the waterholes, observe the, the bees, 
uh, and then if they started to gain access to water, they'd shake the beehives and then the bees would swarm. But the problem was in these parts, the, the bees are equally compromised during the drought period. They, and they simply don't sting. They swarm, but they don't sting. So it actually doesn't work so well um, in a place like Kruger. Um, in, in some of the areas where Lucy's worked in, in some of the, the communal areas, uh, where you can see this, this array of beehives being set up with lines between them and the elephant bumps it, um, then the, uh, the, the bees swarm. There, people can actually um, pro provide water and sugar water to, to maintain the bee populations, and that's actually very effective. But it hasn't really proved so effective in the Kruger. Um, the other project that we worked on was the use of chilies, and um, I've just put a little link down there to um, a YouTube clip of our students doing their work. And they introduced chilies in various layers, le levels of intensity to some of our tame elephants. Um, and it, it, it does work, um, but it requires a lot of maintenance. So it's proved effective in protecting our airport and our nursery and uh, some of the lodges. But you couldn't really string out a, a big chili fence across the, the whole south of the park. So it's effective at, at low scales. But the wrinkle in our project here was working with these elephant whispers elephants. The first time we did it, there's some very funny moments where the elephants eat this and we used oranges, we laced the oranges with, with chili and the elephant pops all the oranges in their mouths and they chew them happily and then they take the chili orange, pop in their mouth and spit it out and we had an instance of one of the, the elephants tossing the, uh, the orange at one of our students. Uh, well deserved, I would imagine. Uh, but the, our, our problem was that the, the big male elephant had been slips. They loved pup, it was there, so oranges and pup. And one of the staff had left um, chili, he, like his pup next to the cage, and he, he really liked chili on his pup. And this elephant had scoffed this thing and um, had developed a taste for chili. So the first time we did the project, five of the six elephants were not interested in chili. The next time we came back, only three of the elephants were not interested. And by the last iteration, they were all totally happy to eat our chili. So there's some learned behavior. There. So that was a, a dismal failure towards the end. But one of the most more innovative projects right now is, is what they call um, disturbance uh, management. And it's human voices that uh, it's proved very effective in North America in controlling the movement of mountain lions. And they've done some really neat work in, in the Kruger Park with rhinos as well. Uh, but most notably, and just north of Pretoria, there's a, there's a crew doing some fabulous work on, on uh, voices. And, um, you, you guys, if you have taken a walk in, in, in the wilderness areas, I see the guys often tell you not to talk because it disturbs animals. And um, given their incredible hearing ability, elephants will hear voices some distance off. And so the argument is that and the human voices are a disturbance, and it really is very effective. But what's interesting, though, is that elephants respond more to languages that have been in the landscape for a long time, so in Guni-speaking peoples. And so what they're now doing is playing... Um, uh, Zulu voices or, or Tsonga voices, um, but it must be sporadic and 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 uh, um, it, it can't be anything regular about it. So they set up these speakers around the landscape just to play conversations of people speaking or singing. And literally, it has. I mean, the, the rhinos are certainly running from these areas, and obviously, you want to keep rhinos out of areas <clears throat> works well. But it, it certainly works on elephants. So that's another idea that they are trialing at the moment. So the argument really is that the elephant question, this elephant problem is not a simple one. Yes, of course, they are, they've got big appetites and they're impacting big trees. <clears throat> and we are seeing an impact um, on the trickle down effect, but the argument is actually need both states. And so um, the park has engaged in a range of different management actions through dropping fences and, and attempting contraception, but really the waterhole closure is, has proved to be the most effective. And at this stage, um, we would argue that there's, um, we're not seeing that whole scale change in vegetation structure where you see sort of tipping over the thresholds, uh, but we're collecting, we continue to collect the data um, uh, to, monitor the, to monitor the situation. But there in a nutshell is the uh, a description of, of what's happening in the Kruger Park. And just to wrap up um, the talk, um, you know, we, we built this state-of-the-art facility in the Kruger through sort of the rammed earth technologies and otherwise as a platform for uh, um, university courses and science leadership course. We're busy with our women science course at the moment. And the reason I mention that is that these teams are the ones that go out and collect the data. And so if you ever are interested, feel free to get hold of me through Mike or through the, the links down below. 
And uh, if you're interested in, in volunteering to come do some research, I uh, can certainly put you to work. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed uh, just a brief description of our research and very happy to take questions. Thank you, Lawrence. That was incredibly fascinating. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned uh, about the Bora beetle and Pat wrote to me ahead of this asking uh, the one that we're having problems with in Cape Town and in Joburg, uh, the shot borer, is there any problem in the Kruger with that particular beetle? Uh, not as yet, no. So um, they were actually very, very strict about it. We've got some Llewellyn Foxcroft and his team head up the Alien Biota um, project, and they've, they've been monitoring um, the situation for quite some time now. So you're not allowed to bring your own firewood into the park, and that's the main conduit of, of these beetles, if people bring firewood from home. So no wood products can come in the park, and they search your cars quite extensively at, at the gates to prevent to prevent um, any wood products coming in. So at this stage, and we're all on the lookout for it because they're, they're very obvious signs. You can see the black frass um, and of course the shot uh, holes. Um, the problem is that we of course have plenty of indigenous um, taxa, plenty of indigenous shot or beetles, uh, but they don't have that same signature black, um, black mark. So at this stage, no impact here. And then uh, Bob asked, he said, uh, Jeremy Midgley and team also published work demonstrating that the tree's destruction results in new trees being infertile uh, or something like that. Um, do yes, you, that's... Do you know anything about that? I do. We've just published it right now. Um, it's all very exciting. So well, one of the problems here is that... Um, so elephants, when they push over the trees, um, you know, they reduce them to ground level. They, and and um, you know, some of them will are able to re-sprout or, or uh, reproduce vegetatively. Um, and if they can get to a critical minimum height, then they can then they flower and produce fruit. And so the real problem right now is that uh, some of the species are being maintained in a very low shrub-like state. So the, the plant we worked on that the, the paper is referring to is, is uh, the lala palm. And so we did surveys up in the north and we looked at uh, the minimum height required for these things to produce flowers. So that same exclosure that I showed you, a fenced off area, inside the exclosure, inside all the camps, the lala palms are, you know, 10 to 12 meters tall, producing plenty of fruits and, and uh, flowers and fruit. And uh, so, you know, seemingly fine. Uh, but outside of the fenced off areas, we, 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 you do see a reduction in the average height of these plants and actually very few fruits. So it renders species like um, the lala palm or even mapani um, infertile. And the problem is if you suppress them for enough time, then uh, the mapani will switch into a shrub state and then it never, it kind of bypasses the adult stage. So it goes, if you imagine the worldview of a, a mapani, a seedling grows into a sapling, grows into a shrub, gets chomped by an elephant, becomes a shrub. And if you keep in that state for longer, eventually it just senesces. And so it doesn't actually go into that adult state. So certainly for some species, we've seen sterilization by elephants. Um, I've got Ian who's raised his hand. Um, Ian, um, do you want to ask your question there? Uh, Ian, can you hear us? I think, I think you're on mute there, Ian. While Ian's unmuting, um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. There we go. Yes, sir. You can hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I'm wondering, is there any evidence that there's been elephants living in the Western Cape? There, there would have been, but there would have been transients. So certainly there's, there's you know, um, if you think of some of the rock art in the Cedarburg, um, so elephants have been here quite recently. Uh, but I think the argument, like most of the bigger bodied animals that lived in the Western Cape, they would have been transient. So they would have benefited from those immediate post fire environments, but they, they would have spent most of their time in the caroid like system or the rhinocephalus, um, particularly as I say in the post fire state. So the Nisna elephants might shelter in the forest, but they actually forage mostly on the forest edges and in the Karoo areas. And there they would focus on species like speckworm and any of the succulents. Um, so yes, elephants would have been found in these areas, but I doubt they would have been residents. They're, they're just simply, and particularly in the Fenbos, because the, the forage quality is so poor um, as a consequence of the very poor soils in, in, in the Fenbos. Right, thank you. 
Sure, We've actually sure. found on, on this reserve where we live, right in the Overberg, we found uh, elephant bones from a hyena den right here in the limestone cave. So they're obviously here many, many years ago. Um, Seriously? Yeah. Fantastic. Right here where we are. Uh, Lawrence Brichan asks, um, there's still 70 of these water holes open. Um, is there a plan to close all the man-made water, uh, water holes at some point? going forward or we're going to keep why keep these 70 open yeah so it's actually they, they'll probably keep those 70 um at least functioning um whether they're water in or not is depending whether they switch on the the, the, the the pumps whether they activate the pumps again but the argument is they probably will maintain them just in these extreme doubt periods there's um there is concern certainly in, in 2015 2016 2017 um the dramatic mortality in some of these populations, which is totally normal and natural. Um, they, did, they did keep a couple of water holes in, in some of the areas where they felt like um, it was necessary. But the other is that tourists like water holes and it's the best place to see animals. And so, you know, the mandate for the Kruger Park is, there are multiple mandates. So yes, of course, ecosystem integrity is one thing, but the other is also the touristic experience because that's what pays the bills. And we're seeing the extent of it now during the COVID-19 uh, uh, impacts because you know, the funding sources have more or less dried up. And so you also got to look after tourists and hence the, you know, the pressure on elephant uh, um, contraception and so on. And so th there is a need to keep some of the, the water holes open now. Um, just asking a question from Joe here. Um, thanks for the talk, love your work. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how big trees recruitment is maintained in uh, Eswatini without elephants, i.e. no pressure on the, uh, you know, from marillas or similar plants, dispersals of elephants. Yeah, and therein lies the problem. So in, in conservation areas, um, you're actually seeing a decline in um, the recruitment of, of particularly species like Bellinites and marilla. And it's actually quite hard to find a seedling. Um, but where there are people, you see recruitment is absolutely fine. And the same, the same holds for, for um, baobabs. Um, so in the presence of people, we obviously like the fruits, and then, but you also concentrate the fruits quite substantially. And so when, we, when you make marula beer, or and you can actually make really good pesto out of, out of uh, marula nuts, by the way. Um, that's a big industry in the low field. And so when people eat the fruits, uh, they discard the seeds for the most. Um, and so you actually have quite a concentration of seeds um, and around homesteads, you still see pretty good recruitment. Or you can imagine somebody's herding uh, uh, their cattle and it's summer, collect fruits. It's a great vitamin C resource, great moisture. And as you walk, you just toss the seeds over your shoulder. And you enhance the germination of many of these species by removing the fruit. Um, and so just simply the act of removing fruit already improves germination. And of course, if you can crush the nut a little bit as well, that further enhances. Um, but uh, yeah, so you actually see, we are seeing a decline in some of these um, elephant dispersed or elephant aided germination species, and as it's notably. So it's actually, the devil is in the detail, and it's one of the projects we're looking at at the moment. I've got a PhD student from Swaziland who's, who's doing that at the moment. Uh, you mentioned COVID uh, uh, briefly before this. Uh, on a personal note, are you able to continue this work? A lot of your students are, are still in America, they can't get back. How's it affecting what you're doing at the moment? And are you concerned about your research going forward? Yeah, it, it's, it is a significant challenge for us. So, so both organizations that we run, um, OTS, you know, the, it's our lifeblood bringing students into South Africa. And then Sasani Trust, uh, we depend, we also run courses for um, German and, and Australian universities. And that's how we generate the income to pay for the South African courses. But um, we, we actually, we've got a course in session. I think it's the first, first course that's being run in the Kruger. So very strict regulations. And so on. But we, we, have, we, we do a lot of fundraising as well for a women's science course in particular. Um, and people are you know, very supportive of that initiative. And it's young, early career um, women um, and a, a real mixture, anybody from Sand Parks employees to university students. And we have 10 students with us at the moment and they, they're doing this biannual survey of, of ours right now. So we, we're still able to function and do our thing, but COVID has definitely had a, a big impact on tourism, but also travel. 
and it's we, you're going to start seeing the squeeze in some of these conservation areas. And we're actually just um, doing the analysis at the moment and writing a paper on the future of conservation and just how conservation actually should be eligible for a bailout in these times. But as long as we come up with a better model next, that isn't so quite so reliant on, on ecotourism. It's a great model and it's a non-consumptive model, but it's now we see it has its weaknesses. And a last question from my side. Um, uh, we spoke to Craig Spencer a couple of weeks back, who's also based in Baluli, close to, to where you are. Have you noticed that the animals are behaving differently without so many humans around? Funny you should ask that. So um, during lockdown, of course, only essential services people could move. And we thought, I've got 40 camera traps. So we put out camera traps and got permission to move around the area. And we put 20 inside Skukuza, 20, uh, 10 on the periphery of Skukuza, and then 10 way out in the bush as a, as, a, as a control for the project. So, and then we've left them running for almost three months now. Three months? Two and a half months. And uh, the idea is that we, you know, that we service them, we change batteries on a regular basis, and we're comparing not only inside the village with outside, but also the various stages of the lockdown. And anecdotally, it certainly seems like, um, and obviously there's a complicating factor because now in the winter months, you start seeing the change behavior anyway. But outside of Skukuza, we see a lot more big bodied animals. We see a lot more um, buffaloes, elephants, rhinos. And what is happening, we see quite a few little baby rhinos and otherwise. But inside the village, you typically don't see or not, or many elephants or, or buffalo and otherwise. But of late, we've, been, we've found our first rhino in the village. And so I think uh, you could make the argument that there is a change in behavior. We're going to pull all the camera traps in on, on Saturday, actually, and then we'll start sifting through the 40 camera traps, 4,000 images per camera. It's quite a bit of sorting. But yeah, anecdotally, we, we start to see quite a bit of movement in the village. And now that, of course, now that you could, and one of the funny things is you could only walk between six and nine, right? Or run and cycle, which is, of course, on our camera traps, you see is the most active time for leopards. It's all very entertaining. And I don't, re I don't think people realize just how, you know, the time we worked out to work is leopard at like 6.45 and then somebody walks past at 7. So animals in the landscape, uh, we're just fortunate that they have no interest in us. Thank goodness. Well, Lawrence, thank you so yeah. much for your time. It was really, really great. Uh, we will record this. And so please share it with uh, all of your friends. Um, Lawrence, uh, people can contact you on those contact details or please just write to myself. Uh, or anyone at Wellcoast if you want to volunteer. And thank you for everything you do, Lawrence. And uh, we really appreciate the great work you're doing. We'll stay in touch. Have a wonderful Absolutely. evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, join us next week, everyone, um, to have another great conversation. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.